I'm not a philosopher, I'm a sociologist and a lawyer. So I started transferring some of these ideas into, into contexts I, I could kind of make sense of, if you like. And, um, and your prehistory and hyperhistory are the two areas which kind of fascinate me in a way, because they, um, they encapsulate a lot of what goes on in, in law. And the reason I say this is, you know, one of the first questions that law students are sometimes set is one of the most futile, which is, what is law? And, and it's really, it's a, it's a very deceptive question because nobody can answer it, nobody's ever answered it, and nobody will answer it, but it kind of sets them off on a, a chase where they come up with various things and so on. And, um, but nonetheless, it leaves a kind of residue in people's minds as though there is something there which you can capture conceptually in some way, the law, whatever it is, and so on. And, um, and, and, and it really is quite deceptive. And so this is where I find myself sort of stepping into the sociological shoes. Because when you look at acephalous societies, ones without a head, a leader, or a state, or something like that, you still see law-like things happening. You know, it's not like people are in total chaos or anarchy or, or what have you. They're, they're quite ordered societies. And, and they do it without um, norms being directed from on high. You know, it's not as if any particular constituent part of that society has the monopoly of violence, which is the classic Weberian way of describing law and the state in a way. These are, are, are non-states, unstates, uh, um, which somehow function in, in a very uh, uh, often tolerant, just way. Not always, but there, there are things there. Um, and yes, at the same time, they are replete with certainty because often history isn't recorded in the way that you have been mentioning. Um, but you know, a lot of oral traditions and customs and so forth. It doesn't mean there's it's unchanging, it changes, but uh, um, you have a sense of justice which doesn't build on precedent and development and logical sequences, but more ad hoc, cardi type justice as it's sometimes described. But nonetheless, the societies function very, very efficiently. Um, you could say, in a way, that the degree of uncertainty in those societies is quite low, um, because they often depend on magic symbols and things like this. Um, and not other forms. <clears throat> it's almost as though when we move into modernity or hyperhistory, if you like, um, we are increasing the uncertainty because also, in a way, we've moved away from magic, although it's surprising how much magic and symbolism still remains in law. Um, but we've moved away from magic into science. And uh, uh, the more scientific we have become in some ways, the more uncertain about the world we've, be we've become, because we know we don't have all the answers. We can never have all the answers. So we become very addicted to asking questions and more questions and so on. As you know, the, the, using the metaphor, pushing the boundaries of knowledge, you know, pushing the boundaries of the questions, if you like. And so in a way, we've always been, I think, replete with uncertainty. It's just that we don't articulate it very clearly to ourselves. So if we look at the role of professionals, for example, um, professionals uh, are people, whether it's doctors, lawyers, accountants, whatever, who deal with people's problems, if you like. So somebody comes and says, I have a problem. You know, I, I'm, uh, uh, you know I'm ill. I've just killed somebody. I killed Alice, um, or whatever. Uh, uh, um, you know, I, cook, I had an HSBC account, and um, what do I do? Um, you know, whatever it is like this. And, and, and in a way, then the professional does a, a combination of things, which is part magic and part scientific. You lay hands on the person, either literally or, or figuratively, and you assure them, I can deal with this, don't worry, in some way. You reduce uncertainty. You reduce their uncertainty while you increase yours, which is, what the hell is this problem about and how do I deal with it? And um, the anthropologist uh, uh, Rene Fox um, talked about trying to train 
doctors for uncertainty and how difficult this was because at a certain stage, uncertainty becomes too uncertain, too troubling, too traumatic, and you refuse to accept it anymore. You say, it doesn't really exist. I'm, I'm going to override it. In a way, what you're saying is, um, I'm not going to ask the questions that lead to uncertainty. I'm going to deny these questions even exist in some ways. And it's a kind of um, perverse power which doesn't celebrate the questions but denies the questions. And of course then this leads to all kinds of anomalies and difficulties when mistakes start occurring. How do you account for mistakes? Some are easy. The scalpel's in there, somebody left it in there. But you know, if, if, if um, somebody's uh, illness doesn't get completely cured, is that because they didn't get the right kind of medications, it was incurable, or, or, or what? It becomes much harder to determine there, and the role of questions becomes even more, in a sense, forensic in trying to find out the solutions. But we never get to the final answers in this way. So, yes, uncertainty, in a sense, is endemic, is intrinsic to um, our way of being, I think, in this respect. And I, I really do, you know, I, I agree with what you're saying and I really like the way you put it because I think what you managed to do is strip out a lot of the, the fripperies around this and get to, get to the core. But I think when we look at it, uh, um, if you like, sociologically and so on, we see, yes, this is the way actually people behave. This is the way uh, uh, networks function and so forth. What I want to throw into this part, and, and you know, I think we can actually see it in a sort of post-Westphalian society. I mean, I, as I was thinking as you were talking about that, and I'll wind up here, um, you know, you mentioned universal rights, and we had this whole era when we, we, we had trust in these supranational institutions, the World Bank, the IMF, Bretton Woods, uh, uh, United Nations, UNESCO, I could go on and on and on. And then, you know, in a sense, the Bush era just collapsed all of that and said, it really doesn't matter. It's, you know, we're back to the old idea of the supremacy of the, of the state. However, even while that was happening, all of it was being subverted and undermined by a whole series of, of negotiations going on, the World Trade Organization, the GATT negotiations, the GATT negotiations, and the one that's happening right now, TTIPs, which is about the um, US uh, 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 EU negotiations, all of which are held in secrecy. Quite undemocratic, quite, you know, and, and, and some information gets leaked now and then and so forth and what have you. And it's clear, you know, that the control of information here has been paramount to the successful um, adoption and use of power in, in a global way. Um, but occasionally, of course, it's subverted by the use of things like social media and what have you. So you do get this kind of dispersive uh, uh, actions uh, 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 and this idea of distribution, which I, I do agree with uh, uh, what you're saying there. So the last bit I want to throw in to my pot, if you like, and you've mention this in, in other papers of yours, but you didn't mention it today, is what are we going to do about autonomous artificial agents, the robots, the artificial intelligence, and so on. So I go back to my medical uh, um, example earlier. We know that you know, if you have uh, uh, surgery on your eyes, even though it's programmed by a human, it's all done by machine now. Uh, um, uh, uh, we know that IBM's Wilson is being used for complex remote surgery across countries more and more. We're assigning more and more of our delicate, uh, uh, um, intricate work, which we thought was the, you know, the, 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 the role of humans to deliver to machines. Uh, um, machines which are learning as they are doing things and so on. Machines which themselves may have the potential to start asking questions, may have the potential to raise uncertainty about which we may be powerless to deal with if we don't have the appropriate communication strategies, uh, ethical standards, and so forth. I'll stop there. No, no, I've spoken enough, please. <laughs> <laughs>
can make some comments then. And thank you, thank you very much for, the, for, for a, a, a real uh, wide talk, and it, uh, it kind of kicked off a whole load of ideas. Um, so it's hard to know really where to start. Or, and, but I might just take up this point of uncertainty, because I suppose in management studies, it's often more understood as ambiguity, which seems to be a kind of parallel, might not quite the same, the same concept, uh, but very related. And I suppose, particularly in the 60s, there was a lot of discussions about uh, managing in, in ambiguity and, and managing in, in uncertain situations. And it struck me, I got a, a little uh, email this morning. There's a TED Talk coming out, which is uh, running an organization with no rules. Mm -hmm. uh, and I haven't seen the TED Talk because I just got it today. But it did remind me of back in the 60s, and I suppose the person who was, who was very central in terms of advancing this discussion about managing in ambiguity would have been James March, uh, who was dean of the School of Social Sciences in Irvine in the 60s. And he, he actually conducted an experiment, I suppose, in terms of the School of Social Sciences, in that he, he, he didn't want rules. And he, he came up with the concept of organized anarchy. And it was tremendously influential on people like Mintzberg and uh, Tom Peters and uh, the way in which, which organizations could happen. You, you, can, you can kind of have an organized anarchy, uh, a world without rules. Um, and in many ways, he was reflecting on universities as well, as universities being kind of organized anarchies, uh, and it became a model for, for other organizations. But the curious thing from studying, uh, from studying what was happening in Irvine in the, in the 60s, um, and there was a lot of uncertainty, because let's not have any rules. Let's, the only rule was not to have rules. Um, but you got a lot of uh, pain in Irvine. Uh, you won't, and parallel to, in, in Irvine at that time, they had a, there was a, a commune on campus. And there was a lot of, I suppose, hurt people in the commune. There was about 80 people in the commune. Um, and there was a lot of communes in California in the 60s. And, and it's, an interesting, it's, it's interesting to me that very few people have studied these communes, which are an attempt to create, to create a world that has a lot of uncertainty. Um, uh, and to, and to increase the uncertainty, because I don't know what's going to happen. Let's get rid of the rules. Um, or, and there was a lot of intolerance um, in, in, in those worlds. So I'm not, too sure, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not necessarily bought on the argument that you increase uncertainty and somehow you will get a more uh, tolerant society. Because like, there's a reference to Rawls and to Kant and, and both of them are dealing with thought experiments. So you have a thought experience, experiment about um, the absence of knowledge, the veil, like Rawls' veil of ignorance is, is, is a thought experiment. And, um, and Kant also works with thought experiments. And thought experiments are, are thought experiments, but transferring a thought experiment into, into the real world. Like, and it, there's, the word that came up a few times was this pinch. We have a pinch of uncertainty. But, how much is pinch? Uh, what's a pinch? And a pinch has a number of, of meanings because a pinch is also can be painful. You can get a pinch uh, and be quite painful. Um, so a pinch is an int how, do, how do we ever know? Where is the line um, that we... So I'm not sure with the analogy with, with inflation. And, and there, is a, there is an assumption at the moment that, well, 3% of inflation is, is correct, but... Um, or, or cholesterol. So I'm not, I'm not really bought on, the, on the, some of the analogies with, with uncertainty. Um, but there's, there, there is a, a fascinating set of, I, I probably would have liked more as well on, um, on violence and the monopoly of violence because part of, of the reason the state, and it's interesting with Ukraine and there's talk about the states uh, giving arms. So it's not just things, it's things that could do real damage to you. Uh, it's, and, and it's the monopoly of violence that the state has. And what is becoming quite interesting is in, the, in this context where, where the state is losing, uh, uh, or is finding it's very difficult to operationalize its monopoly on violence. But also in terms of information, because uh, I suppose statistics as a term, was, it's the state getting information, the state, the state information. And, 
and, and the st that, this idea of the state as the information gatherer is, is becoming really problematized. Um, and I know some of us are here, we're interested in the Bitcoin phenomena. And Bitcoin, interestingly, is, is um, the idea is that you have a world where really there is no state and there is no state with a monopoly of violence. But it's still a state where uh, people don't trust, or still a, a context or community where people are mistrustful of one another, which I suppose like Hobbes, which at around the same time in the mid-17th century, is coming up with the idea of the Le Leviathan, which is, is the state that will, will take this violence or, um, and will take this, appropriate the violence and be able to control people. But you, you, there are potentially alternative models where, which, which are displacing the state. Um, and, and Bitcoin then is an interesting phenomenon, of the, an interesting example of that where where the state may be, be sidelined. And, and there are implications then about how, how, is, how does violence manifest itself in, or where, who, who starts appropriating violence um, in, in this world where the state is, is uneasy. Um, so all of these things were coming, uh, probably a load more, but I've probably said more than enough. Um, <laughs> Um, I think I, I was so comforted when you said um, that you were going to show some ignorance because I don't feel so bad about showing <laughs> some of my own now. Um, what struck me in, in everything that you said, and I've read the papers, and, and for me I've always felt that the way that you understand information and the way that I understand information are different. And I think that's because we're coming fr from different worlds. And, and I come from a, an IT or an IS background, an information systems background. And so when I, my first encounter with the notion of information was to do with Shannon's theory of information and the notion of information as entropy. Um, and so I, before today, I just, entropy is the idea that um, a less likely event has more information in it than a likely event. And that's how he looks at it. So um, the view is that the probability distribution of the events coupled with the information about the event forms a random variable whose average, i.e. expected value, is the average amount of information or entropy generated by the distribution. And the units of entropy are referred to as bits. So this was my first view of information. Um, and for me then, information can't be put into boxes where Alice knows some things and doesn't know others. And there's a box around these things where all knowable things are in the box. Um, and for me, information is, is more about probability than futurity and numbers of possible combinations in the future rather than some sort of quantifiable substantial thing. Um, and then later when I looked at information, it was to do with information versus data, how information differs from data. And information scholars, as much as we deride ourselves for doing this now, have spent a lot of time um, viewing information as something in a hierarchy where you've got data uh, that can be assembled into meaning, which is called information, which is ultimately still somehow underneath knowledge, which you go back to just the notion of justifying true belief and what's justified and what's true and what's belief. We can go into those arguments, but those are the ways that, that IS people tend to think about information. And so for me, what's interesting then is um, information and uncertainty as being two sides entropy as an interesting way of thinking about it and then <coughs> your ideas about sort of you talk about the manifest and the latent and that's something mm -hmm. that I find quite interesting then because then you start to think about information as what's latent in phenomena what hasn't come to be yet but might mm -hmm. rather than this other sort of view or potentiality and then from that point of view the notion of distributed cognition distributed morality distributed knowledge and information becomes very very interesting because the number of possible combinations of future latent things goes up. Um, and so that's how I think about it. And it's, it's tough for me because I found the entire presentation so compelling and I'm scribbling frantically notes because oh, this is really interesting. I get it now, I get what he's saying, but all the time I'm, I'm looking at what you're saying with my own views and definitions of these sorts of concepts. So I, I hear what you say and I love it but it's very different from the way that I think about it. And I think that there's something fun there. And just the last thing I wanted to say then is if we go back to the notion of information being related to possible future events and latency or potentiality that may or may not be realized, 
then the notions around big data and what's happening there in terms of predictive capability and the notion of precognition, uh, because that's really what we're trying to do, uh, becomes very interesting for me. So um, that's, these are my thoughts. <laughs> and, and how many days do we have to discuss all this? <laughs> I'm coming back. <laughs> uh, oh, amazing. Uh, this is, uh, Maybe I just start back from, from the last and then look <laughs> backward. Um, so what one reassurance is that um, uh, all I've said today uh, is 100% uh, compatible, uh, uh, reverse, rever reversely compatible, as Michael will say, uh, with, uh, with Shannon. Um, so a moment of advertisement. If you want to know more about this, you get the, it's very cheap, really very cheap, just a few pounds. Uh, information, a very short introduction, uh, and it's very short too. So what, what you find there, uh, and, I, and, I, and I share your pain, uh, uh, is that uh, unfortunately information has so many different meanings for so many different disciplines and people. Now at some point you really feel like, oh, can we have a little map of where we stand here? Because I'm, I'm lost. Certainly I was. Um, so uh, as quickly as I can, um, there was a time when, uh, when, when Shannon and Shannon onwards, basically what, what is better called as the mathematical theory of communication, uh, um, was, was the only way of understanding uh, information, and it was a good one. I mean, that's what we, we have in the engineering department, in the statistical department, and so on. That's what makes things work. Um, now that, at least philosophers, uh, for a moment thought, that's it, that's the solution. And then in, in a matter of maybe a decade or two, they realized that uh, there was a fantastic constraint for anything you want to do, you have to work within that sort of framework. But it doesn't answer the questions you want to ask within that framework. The analogy here is would be uh, discussing tennis by saying, look, there's a lot of Newtonian physics here going on. Yes, there is. And don't even try no, to play tennis without taking into account no, the usual physics. But then, how do I win this game? <laughs> because you know, knowing a lot of physics is not enough. So it, the necessary constraint is absolutely there, and I'm with you. That's what we mean by, uh, for example, uh, moving uh, messages and so on. Uh, you toss a coin, and if it's a fair coin, never seen one, but uh, ideally it's 50-50, so you have one out of two, and it's one bit of information. If you have two coins, you've got four alternatives, you've got two bits, and so on. You can go uh, all the way in terms of twos and eight and 16 and 32 and 64, and that's why, you know, good old days, we had those computers with those memories that now are laughable. That was 200 and something. Um, so that's, that's, the, that's the constraint for any understanding of information today. Within that sort of big framework, you got other meanings of information that uh, pile up. And I, I mentioned for a moment there are at least three. One is strictly directly related, uh, which is the semantic or factual sense, the one I was talking about. Now that means that for any data being exchanged, now Shannon is very clear about this, they don't, the engineer doesn't care about truth, doesn't care about relevance, doesn't care about meaning. It's about probabilities. How, no, how many chances there are that no, the, sent, the, the message sent here is gonna get there and how many uh, sort of uh, uh, points of uncertainty actually erases, basically. Well, that's the, as it were, the layer on which you start building the relevance, the meaning, the truth. So it's kind of accumulate on top of that, and you start talking about your breakfast, etc. But there's also another sense, which is, uh, no, not the fact of the semantic, but it's also the, um, the pattern out there in the world. When we say that the, uh, the fingerprints or the rings uh, of the tree, etc., are information, what we mean is that there's a pattern out there that, if properly exploited, can provide that Shannon-like sort of uh, communication, which I can then interpret, et cetera, all the way down to that's the age of the tree. And then there's a third one, unfortunately, which is not just the semantic and the factual, a story told about something else, the train timetable. It's not just the, the, the pattern out in the world. They're all related, by the way, but, um, and they all sit on top of Shannon. And the third one is the uh, procedural, the uh, algorithmic. If I send you uh, a particular piece of music or I send you an, uh, a piece of software, I've already sent, I've sent you some information. The thing is that it's not about the world and it's not in the world as, the, you know, sort of, uh, as a piece there, but it's for the world, you know, that's the, you know, uh, as something, for something or about something. And that's the, the three categories that we normally use in terms of information. And when it is for something, you know that it's a recipe, it's an algorithm, it's a piece of music, is in order to deliver a particular product, say a particular word processor or a cake or 
particular sonata. So all this is terribly confusing, and I, I'm, I'm with you when you say, like, where are we on this, uh, on this map? Uh, I hope that I didn't contribute <laughs> to the confusion. But basically I was talking on top of Shannon of kind A, the semantic factual, as opposed to on top of Shannon, the algorithmic, or on top of Shannon, the uh, sort of uh, patterns out there in the world. Um, there's a lot of uh, more, more to be said, uh, but I think that I can connect your last point with the first point that you made about um, uh, precognition and anticipatory understanding. And that's back to the artificial agents and uh, AI so we can start connecting mm -hmm. some of the questions. The, there used to be just w one maj major challenge that we uh, dealt with when uh, having AI around us, and that was about intelligence. You are exposed to something that can do something better than you, then you thought you were the only one. Now, it used to be chess, now it's parking the car. Uh, and it used to be surgery, but now no, I'd rather have the robot. And trust me, I'd rather have the robot landing the airplane yeah. than the, no, the pilot who has to be kept you know, kind of with the skills and you go and you know that that's the pilot yeah, yeah. who has to you know, land the uh, aircraft every few times himself or herself because otherwise he doesn't know how to do it anymore. But no, if it's smooth like satin, that's the computer. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, yeah. You don't even notice. Uh, so we used to think that it was us, only us, better than anyone else, and we lost that sort of certainty. But the other thing that we, we also used to think it was uniquely human was freedom. And uh, now, by the way, I don't believe, sorry, believe is not, I know, it's a bit stronger than I don't believe, I know that there's no AI, and I know that there's no AI you can think of in terms of our contemporary science. So anyone who says otherwise, that's science fiction. And is as intolerant as that. Don't believe a word, don't believe the BBC, don't believe the newspapers, don't believe any cranky person. There is no such thing as AI as we can possibly understand today. So we don't even understand the human brain. So, yeah. But there's a lot of smart technology, really smart, that can do things better than us a lot of the times. And Unfortunately, these smart technologies, they can also predict ourselves increasingly well. So these two points, intelligence as doing smart things, well, no, how about that gadget? And humanity as being free, uh, what about uh, that gadget knowing exactly what book you're going to order, what holiday you're going to like, that you are pregnant? Famous case, you know, if you haven't been uh, oh, living on the moon. Uh, uh, and so on. I mean, they, they, are, they know more and more about no, quote unquote, about us than we can possibly imagine. So here the challenge is to re-understand the human, uh, well, our philosophical anthropology in terms of, I'm more refined than just, I'm the intelligent species on, uh, on this planet, can, the only one that can act on information for smart tasks, not true. And as the only species or uh, agents or artifacts on this planet, they can be uh, free, uh, as free as in, you would never guess. Oh yes, because freedom, uh, unfortunately, if it is exercised rationally, is highly predictable. You always go back with the same toothpaste, always. In my case, I'm just astonished. I buy one more and I have that and it's always that, that. And I don't even remember what it was. But I go to the price, the quality, what I like. Da -da -da -da. Bingo, it's always the same. Disappointing in terms of my freedom of choice. But we don't, we don't have, for the philosophers among us, we don't have a philosophical anthropology that can do this today. Uh, good old days, you know, freedom of intelligence, that was enough. Today we've been challenged. Don't believe our word, no, there's no artificial intelligence, no, there's no, but we need to re-understand ourselves much better in light of those machines. Now, I don't know how much time we have, but I want to touch at least uh, one point of all the, the ones that have been uh, made. Um, uncertainty as ambiguity. Um, this is a, it is a difficulty and it will be um, uh, I mean, I think it's fair to say, uh, I'm happy to, uh, to be told that if we understand uncertainty as ambiguity, uh, then there's a, I think there's a completely different analysis to be uh, developed. But I was trying to understand uncertainty as a very clear, I mean, deadly clear question to which you don't have the answer or no, any answer. So I wasn't talking about the uh, Schroeder, uh, the physicist. I wasn't ta talking about a fuzzy picture of a very precise object. I was talking about a fuzzy object with a very sharp picture. Now, a very sharp picture of a foggy day. That's, that's the idea. Now, but this is 
it's foggy. Well, that's well, because it's a foggy day, but it's a very, very sharp picture. So I'm, I'm trying to, I know that it can be ambiguous, uh, the, the, the distinction, but the problem we have sometimes is that we have a fuzzy picture. We just have uncertainty as in confusion, ambiguity, like mm, what's going on? That's not what I'm talking about. What I was talking about was well, sometimes the situation has, say, no particular answer or has many answers, and you don't know exactly which answer, if any, is the good, uh, right answer for your question. So the ambiguity is not, as it were, in the question, but is in the lack of the specific answer for that question. Now, it might seem a bit of philosophical you know, uh, hair splitting, but here we have two different traditions, apparently, of, of analysis. Uh, one of the uncertainty, the other one of the ambiguity. Now, it is true that, uh, as today, I have no idea where the pinch, <laughs> uh, how much is a pinch. Uh, that, well, that is also a classic you know, philosophical uh, issue. And um, I would be already happy if we were to decide that a little bit, whatever the little bit is, is valuable, as opposed to none at all. So uh, presented with the binary first question, yes, some or not at all, I'd be happy to say, well, yes, some uncertainty is good for society. The next question is, oh, what do you mean by how much? I mean, uh, it's like cholesterol. Oh, surely you need to have you know, a particular threshold, above, below, or like uh, inflation. Yes, but we have already answered the first question. That a little bit, some, uh, a, a quantity of some kind is valuable. Then we have the next question, and I agree with you, and I don't have an answer for that. So how far do you want to push this uncertainty? But then I have the impression that there becomes really not a matter of having a, a, a nice theory, because it's not quantifiable stuff like in economics or in medicine. It's not sociology being a little bit more uh, of a dirty job. But then we can do a per case. And when the government is now asking, no, this government, no, uh, back home, the, the British government, no, back home, is asking, we want to have your data, your telephone data, because I need to have the information. I would like to say, no, that's the pinch of uncertainty you have to live with. Mm. That pinch of uncertainty, it's good for you, trust me. It's, no, it's just the kind of pinch of uncertainty that I think it makes the whole system work more uh, efficiently. So, you see, this, at this point, we have shifted the problem from, oh, privacy, no privacy, as in, no, 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 it's the society as a whole that with that amount of Questions asked, but no answered, lives better. So in another context, a liberal society is a, is a society in which any question can be asked, any. But not all of them need to be answered. You can ask me for whom I voted, by all means. It's a free world, but you're not supposed to know. And I'm not supposed to you know, be forced to tell you. That's the difference between you know, a democratic liberal place and one that it isn't. So a place where Augustine, good old days, where there's total transparency because God sees everything and uh, you know, you will be watched, and trust me, as a Catholic, growing up as a Catholic in Rome, you will be watched even when you are at the toilet. Uh, and uh, it's a so, you know, big idea, God's always checking. Well, that's, that's, a, that's a, a society where any question gets answered. Somewhere, somehow, there's a big brother or big God that has all the answers. Mm, not the sort of answer, questions, sort of society I was um, promoting today. So when God is in question, big uh, government has that pinch. <coughs> but I'm with you. And so how much, where, when, uh, case by case at the moment, uh, a bit like cooking. Uh, it's a pinch of salt, uh, like my mom would say. So, mom, how much is a pinch of salt? <laughs> <laughs> so you will know when you, eat, you, when you taste it. Uh, um, there were many other things, but I'm looking at the... Yeah, I think the... Yeah. Well, no, completely. That's why one thing, uh, you, I'm with you entirely. That's why one of the things I said about transparency, for example. I mean, who is processing what, when, where, for what purpose? Well, that's just another way of saying, who is asking which questions? And no, free to ask the questions, as long as sometimes there is a way of saying you're not going to get the answers. So sometimes the problem with, say, with Google just, uh, is, but freedom of, of, uh, of expression. Surely I'm, I'm free to ask. Oh, absolutely. The point is, you don't have the right to know you have the right to ask. Uh, that's a completely different game. So in terms of, uh, uh, no, uh, no, back to some uh, homey practical stuff, uh, about 20 years ago, the uh, politicians lost a big train, which was the search world. They didn't understand. Brussels, they, they had no idea what was happening. 
And uh, because uh, I said everything happens so quickly and so fast, what is happening now is that they are trying to recapture or regain, no, go back on a train which has left a long time ago. Europe has left the whole search, and you can understand how keenly I feel about this given this talk, the whole, as it were, business of uncertainty in the hands of private uh, corporate agents. Fine. Um, well, I'm not from the moon. I, I like profit. The consequence is that the politician now feels disempowered, wants to regain the power politically through law. That's not the way of doing it. Uh, so if you see, no, no, the point that you are raising is crucial in a sort of very practical sense uh, today in terms of good business and good politics. Social questions, um, but I am kind of worried about the limits of, of the way you talk about information and the limits of your analytical strategy for, um, for, for opening up these questions more. And in some sense, I think you talk about information in a very alluring way, um, um, but I think the way you talk about information includes a lot of the complexities about the category of information, about what we mean by information and its relation to, to the social. Um, so I, I'm wondering about you know, your, your, your position on the relationship between information and the difficult philosophical category of truth. Um, it's a, a lot of what you say strikes me as very much in a kind of correspondence type of, uh, of, of mold. Um, and, and so one of the things I'd like to see problematize the category of information a little bit more. because it, it, and, and in some sense, I think you're too close to Claude Shannon. I mean, Claude Shannon's stuff is, is very good for communications and digital signal processing, but not very good for social analysis. And I think there's a big danger, especially, of, of disembodying information and, and desituating information and removing it from the way that it's inevitably <coughs> embedded in social practices. And when you start talking about the hyper, and when you start talking about the virtual, and when you start talking about the information age, um, I think there's a danger of fetishizing information in this kind of way and, and focusing on this it's about idealistic or idealized <coughs> domain <coughs> domain of information. Um, and in some sense, looked in that way, information is, is a pretty meaningless category because I think one, also, one always has to think about information in practice. And one always has to think, and, and so there's a danger of focusing too much on so-called content of information as it is constitutes some kind of truth. Um, without you focus around the practices associated with the production, the consumption, uh, the consumption of, and the politics of this, of, of information. So, so, so I would say that, you know, your last point about the, the morphology of information flows is the morphology of uncertainty. I'd say, no, the morphology, morphology of uncertainty is the morphology of social practice in all its dynamic uncertainty. And, 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 and I think, Fetishizing information in this kind of way is dangerous because it 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 it, it, it rips it from from this kind of mosaic of social practice, which is which is which is, is crucial to understanding that pattern. Mm -hmm. um, I'm pretty much on the same page. Uh, I at the risk of uh, self advertisement, um, the first volume in the the trilogy. Four volumes. It's called the philosophy of information, and um, as Gianluca kindly mentioned, and uh, there are several chapters. One of which deals with uh, truth and information. Another chapter deals with uh, what it means to have a justification for information, and another one on uh, a network understanding, as in social practice network, uh, of um, exchange and uh, uh, support for information. So. I, I apologize for the self advertisement and it wasn't meant to, we didn't uh, get this uh, prepared in advance. Uh, but I'm so much with you that basically I'm, well, let me put it this way, I'm dealing with it. Having said, uh, saying I've dealt with it sounds badly, uh, so I, I'm, I'm engaged. Um, just to give you one small example, uh, information is normally treated uh, in terms of truth uh, as um, 
there's a, there's a huge debate called the veridicality debate on information. And uh, uh, I'm on one side of it, uh, together with other people, uh, important people, um, where I uh, argue that for something to be uh, information, it has to be true. There's something called false information is like a false friend, someone who's not a friend. <laughs> and false information just means not information. Uh, it doesn't mean something that is information and happens to be false. But of course, you know, from a, a general, more Shannon perspective, I mean, ending is information, whether it's true or false, but there's a difference here to be made between a context where you don't care about the truth value of information and a context where you start saying, look, this is semantic information, meaningful, ha has it to be true in order to do X and Y, Z. There's an, a huge amount of work to be done here. Uh, one of the things that uh, you discover, especially from a Shannon perspective and probabilistic analysis, is that if you do some epistemic logic, which is a branch of model logic, which is a branch of logic which deals with this stuff, you realize that in the probability scenario, going back to you know, part of the question, if something is informative, the more unlikely it is, hmm? you, are you with me? No, thanks. What was the time uh, today? It was exactly the same time that it was yesterday at this time. Thank you so much. Yeah, that's, that's definitely true, but not very informative because it's a tautology. Uh, or, no, more and more informative, it's three o'clock, or it's three, uh, three and two minutes, and three, two minutes and five seconds. The less likely, the more informative. Well, you got these two problems, for example, in terms of truth, and I end up with this truth reference. At the one end of the spectrum, y you have the uh, non-informativeness of tautologies, which is great as long as you don't realize that mathematics is reducible to logical tautologies, and therefore mathematics is totally non-informative. Uh, yes, that's a sense, but oh. That is called the scandal of deduction, Hintika and so on, has been debated for over. You find more in the philosophy of information book. Or you can go to the opposite uh, direction. And say, well, the more unlikely something is, well, the more informative it is. Oh, and guess what? The most unlikely of all things is a contradiction. And that ends up by being the most informative thing you can ever have. Something that is always false is so unlikely to be never the case. And therefore, it's the most informative. That's called the bar healer Carnap paradox, and it's something else you find in the book. So, yes, truth, social practices, network theory, it has to be dealt with by the book. I, so yes, I, uh, so uh, uh, just ask my question here. This historical example, just the reality of the 1790s, France, right? Tolerance. Tolerance of your own at that time was you believe in Catholicism, Catholicism, Protestant, Baptism, Methodist, Presbyterian, or Calvinist, right? But they all tolerate their own. You make excuses for your own, but you don't tolerate any other. There's no way they'll tolerate the other the other side, the other faction. But Voltaire came along, right? And he said, you must believe in the supreme deity. So now tolerate all of all is required. So he asked that all Catholics, Protestants, Baptists, and Catholics, <coughs> tolerate each other, the supreme deity, and each other, right? But he may assume something, his false friend, something, right? He believed the supreme deity was benevolent. But the supreme deity could be better, and you've got a different scenario altogether that people might be involved. So, is the past going to be replayed from history historically every 500 years or so as we come along? Or, in another philosophical concept, in objective physical reality, we have 4% of the universe is known, 96% is unknown. So we're actually dealing with a 96% uncertainty situation as we're in. How much more uncertainty do you want <laughs> in the context that we have? Yep. Uh, I think that's a great way of ending this, uh, this lecture. How much uncertainty do we really want? Thank you very much. That's a, a wonderful way of ending it. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.